All right, perfect. So, um, welcome everyone again. Today we are going to talk about anterior knee pain, which is one of my favorite things to discuss uh, because as a knee surgeon, it forms a substantial proportion of my practice. And I think it's very relevant where if we are sports physicians or we're handling teams uh, in groups in particular, it's a very high frequency with which we're seeing this problem these days. So around 10 to 15%, if you have a team of around 20 players, you may have three of them coming to you with peripatellar or retropatellar pain, and which is why this is important to discuss. So there's two of us today uh, that are going to talk about this topic. Uh, myself, I'm Dr. Mithen Shed, and I'm a practicing knee surgeon, and my colleague, Dr. Abhishek Kini, who's a foot and ankle surgeon. He's about to join us shortly. Uh, meanwhile, I'm just going to start by discussing what we mean by anterior knee pain and what are the perspectives of a knee surgeon. And then hopefully Abhishek will join us in around 15 to 20 minutes. And then we can take the foot perspective as well. So I'm going to share my screen now. Right. Okay. Just give me a second, please. Okay. So, what do we mean by anterior knee pain? So, this entire patellofemoral malcomposite. Uh, we're talking about three things in particular, okay? We have an extreme scenario where you receive a patient with a dislocated patella or a scenario where somebody on field has dislocated the patella and it's fallen back in place and then they are brought to you. And then there is this other spectrum of problems where the patella hasn't come out entirely, but the primary complaint is something is wrong. There's discomfort. There's low confidence and there's a giving way feeling. And most of these can be divided in two parts. There's pain or there's instability or there's a bit of both. And we're going to discuss patients who predominantly present to us with anterior knee pain only. And we're going to make sure that we don't confuse them with patients who have instability because uh, the diagnosis as such is different and hence the management is different as well. Now, like I said, it's about 15 to 20% uh, the prevalence. And why we need to treat is because this is one issue that has a lot of compliance problems and patients don't really understand what's happening to them. Hence, they don't seek continuous treatment and hence uh, there is no happiness. Now, either the dislocation, relocation patients or the instability patients, or the pain patients, all of them have similar risk factors. Right from birth where breech deliveries, they say are connected to uh, not good trochlea formation or not good patella formation. And that's why the patellofemoral composite actually creates issues. And this is seen more often in females. This is seen more often in people with hypermobility. That's a Baton score more than five. And of course we see this more in adolescents compared to adults. So how we're going to discuss this over the next half an hour is history, evaluation, diagnosis, and then management. And when we talk of history, there are certain things that are very important. Of course, uh, we can create long forms and ask hundreds of millions of things, but what is of value is around five to six things. One of them is whether the patients come to you within the first two to three weeks of complaints or it's chronic, that means the patients having this issue since um, one year and two years and three years. And this frankly decides the prognosis. So everybody who's caught early, we hopefully catch them at the right time, start the management and they're the ones who'll do well. And anybody chronic, we are expecting say between 40 and 90% failure, depending on what evidence you allude to. We also know that all those cases that are going into chronic anterior knee pain, 
uh, have a pro propensity towards patellofemoral arthritis and which is why it's important to catch these early. Now, the next important thing to know on history is where the pain is actually located. Most of it, like we discussed, is retropatellar or peripatellar. But we need to go further and try and make sure that patients don't have any medial pain because this may be arising out of medial compartment arthritis or meniscal issues or many other things. We need to know if it's at the top of the patella, the tip, the inferior tip of the patella, the tibial tuberosity or overlying the patella tendon, or it's not frankly entirely peripatella, but just anteromedial or just at the Gerdes tubercle. And all of these entail different diagnosis and hence different treatment. Next, uh, the timing is very important. So we, we, we need to differentiate two kinds of patients. Patients who say that they have symptoms when they're using stairs, when they're doing the squats, uh, say if it's the left leg, then they complain of using the clutch of the car. Uh, all of these, if you have problems during loaded knee flexion, then this is bordering more towards patients who have patellar instability. It's creating problems when they're doing that particular movement and they can't really describe that fear or instability and maybe they're talking of pain. Whereas uh, most standard anterior knee pain patients complain of such kind of uh, peripatellar pain after the movement is done. So they'll be like we've written upstairs uh, on the top 25 year old female dancer who comes to me with anterior knee pain. The most likely complaint is she's able to go through the dance session, uh, but then the evenings are really bad. So much so that she's really thinking if she wants to do the dance session the next day. And there's of course a theater movie sign where if they're sitting with their legs folded for a prolonged period, there's always this tendency to push the legs into extension and which makes them feel marginally better. And then there's instability. So on history, many of them complain that they lose balance. And we need to know that losing balance in these kind of patients will be of two kinds. One, where the quadriceps is giving way because it's weak or there's sudden reflex inhibition. And it can lead to instability, but that's not patellofemoral instability. And that's one kind. And the second kind is what we're not dealing with today is where they actually have an apprehension that the patella will subluxate or dislocate. Last, most of these patients also complain of clicks, clicks more than crepitus, uh, clicks during the early course of disease in acute patients. And if there is a lot of lateral tilt to the patella, very tight, deep lateral retinaculum, then it can go on to a crepitus, which is like a click, but felt throughout the range. Uh, throughout the flexion range. Uh, unfortunately, the click and the crepitus is not a great prognostic indicator of how the patient's going to do or is not going to dictate a great deal of management. And this symptom per se doesn't hold a lot of value. So the next important thing that we need to know is whether this pain is after a particular episode where there's twisting of the knee or a fall or a blunt trauma to the kneecap, or most likely is because of repetitive micro trauma, so to say, where the patient saying that Hame to kuch nahi hua tha. we had never fallen down or nothing's ever happened, but then there's overload, which they can't understand. So that's where this, uh, the dyes homeostasis curve comes into play. So if somebody is born with poor biomechanics or malalignment. And if there is a repetitive overload in terms of frequency or intensity, frequency or intensity, then at some point, this is like the iceberg phenomenon, they are going to cross the threshold. So when you're taking history of these patients, it's very important to know what's that one thing that asks sort of tilted the patient over the threshold. If you catch that one thing uh, over, then that's like the best scenario because you're going to then go on to tell the patient during management that, okay, this is the one exercise or the one episode that tilted you above the threshold. And that's the one thing that's very important to avoid during treatment. 
So this can be caught only on history and which is why you must remember this big star on the left. So this is like an unsaid thing. So the patient's never going to complain of this one particular history that you want to elicit and you need to take it out. Next, uh, once you've done with asking all the standard things, you just need to be careful about these four or five things. So there's a small proportion of patients, around 5% maybe, uh, depending on whether you're seeing acute anterior knee pains or chronic anterior knee pains, where they'll be very sensitive, which is hyperalgesia, or you, you really haven't moved the patella, or uh, of course, when you're at the history stage, they tell you that they do small things which shouldn't ideally elicit pain, but they get pain. So again, that's allodynia. And there's kinesiophobia in these chronic anterior knee pain patients where they say they just don't want to do certain things because they are afraid. And kinesiophobia actually tilts your diagnosis more towards patellofemoral instability than pain. And both of these subsets, if they go into chronic mode, if somebody has had complaints since one or two years, then they are going to catastrophize which means that uh, they come to you with this doomsday look on their face and say that they visited two, three orthopedic surgeons, two, three physiotherapists, and they know that they are doomed. Nothing's going to happen. Uh, many of these, then you start wondering whether this is a form of complex regional pain syndrome and you need to treat them a little differently. And as orthopedic surgeons, of course, we have medicines on our side and these are the ones where we're thinking of neuromodulators, uh, certain kinds of anxiolytics that we can begin. And most of our patellofemoral patients, we do a functional scoring and would like to use the Kujala score. But anterior knee pain as such is more of a physiotherapy domain. And for orthopedic surgeons, most of the times, we really aren't charting how these patients are doing. So it'll be nice for certain physiotherapists to know that, uh, to find out if something other than a Kujala score can really work better because most of that is for patellofemoral instability rather than anterior knee pain. Next, we come to examination where, again, just four or five things that you need to be very careful about. First thing that you do when you see a patient with anterior knee pain is try and rule out instability. So you try and replicate the patient's symptoms where the patient has pain and you try and move the patella out. So if the patella is really moving out and the patient has apprehension, then this patient, you should go back and ask the patient whether the pain was during the movement or after. And then this patient becomes an instability, uh, has an instability component and just not pain and your treatment and approach will differ. Next, you need to check the joint lines, the medial side, the lateral side and different... Uh, places around the knee to just confirm that there are no other originators of the pain. The most common one actually, which uh, the treatment of course goes side by side, is something with to deal with the infrapatellar fat pad. So there are many things that can go wrong with that region uh, and there are many names to give it. Same thing with anterior knee pain too. We can talk about it as patellofemoral pain syndrome and PFP and a lot of other things. But what we are trying to say is if the patient gets pain uh, on complete extension of the knee and there's a way to check this and I'll come to that, then we can actually differentiate inferior fat pad involvement from other causators of the knee pain. So you can just hold uh, the patella and try and extend completely so if the Hoffa's fat pad impinges, this patient's going to have this sudden sharp shooting pain just below the patella, and it can tell you that there's something wrong with the IFP. Then, of course, you need to check the strengths of all muscles, and this is very standard where most of the anterior knee pain discussions revolve around the VMO having a later onset of activation, a VMO having lesser strength compared to the lateral structures, and you can, of course, check all of this if you have a manual dynamometer. And then you need to check flexibility. So you're going to check flexibility of the quadriceps, the gastroxoleus, the hamstrings. Uh, but most of the times we forget to check if the anterior hip is flexible or not, the anterior hip muscle group. 
And that's why this picture where you must check how that's doing. And that's one thing we miss out on. Of course, if you dwell deeper, then you know that the patellofemoral malcomposite is seen in patients who have an increased femoral antiversion or an increased external tibial torsion. So if you're not able to find any glaring abnormalities in the previous uh, things that you did, then it would be really worthwhile to check the hip internal rotation, the hip external rotation, and the foot progression angle. Uh, and if you find any abnormalities in these, most of these are static, but there are a lot of ways in which you can change the rehab protocol to compensate for these. The three things we always do, I always tell all my colleagues to check because these are the three things probably patients are doing at home as well and struggling. And that's one, going downstairs. So just a step